Hello, hello, and welcome to Pints with Aquinas. I am so glad you're here. My name is Matt Frad, and today we are going to be talking to two Dominican friars about restoring the, the beauty of sacred chant in the liturgy. Thank you so much for being here. If this is the first time you've showed up at a channel like this, you would really help us out by clicking the thumbs up button and subscribe and then that bell button so you can uh, make sure you don't miss out on upcoming videos. Before I introduce you to our two friars today, I want to say thank you to Catholic Chemistry for sponsoring this show. Um, you know, obviously all of you are being called to be Dominican priests. We, we all know that. But there might be some of you who aren't. I don't know, maybe 1% of you. But those of you who are watching right now, you might be a single lady or a single gentleman, and you do feel a call to marriage, but you, you're finding it very difficult maybe to have good relationships in this COVID era. Go check out my friends at Catholic Chemistry. It is run by a solidly orthodox since this is a, we're talking about chant, Latin Mass Catholic. He's the guy who founded this. It's a beautiful website that will help you uh, meet people who are more serious about their love for Jesus Christ than they will ever be for their love for you. But their love for Jesus Christ will lead them to love you in the appropriate way. This is a wonderful website, and uh, I know several people who have found their spouses on this website. So click the link in the description and go check out Catholic Chemistry. You can do video chats uh, with people so you don't have to give them the, you know, your number, your Skype information right away. And you'll meet people who are super serious about their faith. CatholicChemistry.com. CatholicChemistry.com. Brothers, lovely to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having Hello. us. Yeah, honored. Uh, let, 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 uh, do me a favor, and maybe we can go one by one and uh, just tell, tell me a little bit about yourselves. Well, I can Stay start. Fun. I'm uh, Brother Stefan, yeah. yes, <laughs> from the Netherlands. Um, so I started my novitiate a few years ago um, in Cambridge in England because I'm from the Dutch province of the Order of Preachers and we don't have enough vocation to run our own uh, novitiate. So we started in Cambridge. And um, after that, I came to Freiburg to study uh, philosophy and theology here. And there we met each other, Paul Alexandra mm. and, my, and me. And um, yes, we have started this project a, few, a year ago. So that's a little bit of information. I'm from a Catholic family, big Catholic family uh, in the Netherlands. <laughs> and um, always have been very much interested in Gregorian chant and, and in the traditions of our church. Beautiful, beautiful. Brother Alexandra. Alexander, sorry. Yeah, I'm from Switzerland and I, I entered the, the order, the Dominican order, uh, one year before uh, Stefan. So five, five years ago already. Oh my God. Five years ago. <laughs> and uh, and um, also uh, in, in Switzerland, we don't have enough vocations to have a, a a novice, a proper novice in Switzerland. So I I, uh, I went to France in Strasbourg, in France to do my novice, and then yes. I came back to to Fribourg, where I I studied before being a Dominican, and I, I met the brothers there actually, and uh, I came back to Fribourg to to complete my uh, theological studies, and uh, I just uh, finished my master in theology. Uh, back uh, at Christmas, last Christmas. So, and I, then I left Switzerland to, for, for France. And that's why Stefan and I are not together uh, tonight. We are, uh, this morning, we are, uh, we are, uh, I'm in France in Lille for a six month for a apostolic work, more than studies. And then coming back to Fribourg. Very good. Well, it's it's great to it's great to hear from you. I got people in the chat uh, who are telling me that we've got some kind of static in the audio, which I think is on my end. So I apologize. Can you can you brothers hear that? Yes, I do like a little it? bit. Of... Okay. Yes. Well, I'll do my I'll do my best here. I think what I'll do is I'll ask the questions and then I'll mute myself. I apologize for that. Um, but it is so lovely to have you on the show. Um, you know, maybe we could just kind of begin with a simple question, and that is to say, tell us a little bit, let's start really general, about the importance of beautiful music in general, beautiful music in the liturgy, and why this is a passion of yours. 
Well, I think um, in our liturgy, it's very important to have not only texts, but also art, uh, forms of art that can actually help us to, to elevate our souls towards, uh, towards Christ. And that it's just the fact that that works better with music. So if we only use, use text for that, that's not the same experience we have then. So um, in our liturgy in general, it's important to have these, these, uh, these very um, sensitive things which help us to, to go towards the truth of our liturgy. So it's a way to actually um, get towards the essence of a liturgy, which is an encounter with Christ, of course, in the sacraments, especially in the Holy Eucharist. Um, but these texts are really embodied by the music itself. And because of the music, it, it, it helps us to, to have this, this, real, um, uh, this real personal encounter. So not just an intellectual one, but something with our entire being. Um, with our emotions, with our entire person. And I think that is very important because our Christian faith is not just a faith of, of dogmas and everything. That's very important indeed. But that helps us to have this living encounter with Christ himself. And that's a personal encounter. And music helps a lot to, uh, to, to have this personal encounter with Christ, I think. That's one of the reasons. There are, of course, lots of reasons. Yeah, bro Brother Alexandra. Yeah, and also for um, uh, a, a lot of people who who come to 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 our church, Dominican Church, uh, in Europe and in, in in Switzerland, they a lot of them don't don't know a lot uh, theologically about about faith or uh, about the the doctrine of the church, and so beauty and sacred music is is really a way for for them to to enter a celebration to to enter a liturgy and it uh, it gives them um another path towards understanding what they are living with god exactly their relation and so in that sense beauty is 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 really 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 important i think were you it's, raised with uh, beautiful music? I, I certainly wasn't. It was sort of uh, warmed over bad Protestant hymns or wishy-washy, terrible, I shouldn't blame the Protestants, we did it to ourselves, Catholic hymns that weren't terribly inspiring at all. They were kind of cheesy and made the faith feel, feel, feel as such. Did, did you experience that or were you raised with this beautiful music? Uh, yeah, in Switzerland, I, 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 uh, I have the same experience as you. Uh, it's we we have all this um, this tries of translation of Latin texts in from the the 60s and the 70s in in, in French and they are they are not musically bad but the the, the translations and uh, and even some some of them a lot of them are actually uh, musically speaking are quite bad and so. It was certainly for me uh, uh, a way to to, re to renew my my, my experience uh, of God and my faith uh, by discovering Gregorian chant, because I th that's very personal. But you cannot beat Gregorian chant in terms of musicality for for a liturgy, I think. For me, it was different. Because in the Netherlands, actually, it's, it's still very much present. So after the Second Vatican Council, we didn't stop using Latin, for example, in our liturgies. So in our parish, where I came from, um, we had weekly Gregorian chant masses and we had polyphony and everything. But in the in the new uh, in the new rite, actually, so it's very interesting that in the Netherlands, uh, these these places of, of worship, of dignified worship are still very much present, um, even though, of course, the country is very secular. But um, I think there's uh, there's still a lot of, of beauty there, and it also helps that I'm coming from a, from a Catholic family, big Catholic family. So my mother is a musician herself; she has a choir, and well, there's this entire culture still in the house of of playing music together, singing together, and um, so that also helps to really have this this musical aspect. And um, so it was always part of my life; it was never really uh, absent of my life. But I, I think I'm a little bit an exception even in the Netherlands. <laughs> yes, in Australia and here in America, it feels like we've gone through decades of subpar um, 
less than beautiful i'm trying to be charitable music but it, it does feel like there's this this desire to reconnect with the tradition that people our age weren't necessarily given some of you were but i wasn't where is this hunger and this longing coming from and give us some signs of hope that you see as gregorian chant is beginning to be implemented in in more uh, liturgies perhaps one one of the signs we, we see very, uh, very concre concretely uh, in our uh, communities or uh, among the, the believers who, who come to, to our Dominican um, priories is that the, the, new, the new generation is, is not, in, is not uh, I ideologically uh, conflicted with uh, Latin mass and Gregorian chant. And so the if we offer them uh, Latin uh, sacred chant and Gregorian chant, they are they are really uh, discovering it from from zero. They 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 just didn't know it. So that's a sign of hope because they are uh, as soon as they come to church by themselves, they discover Gregorian chant and it becomes the the way. To express their, their their faith, it's 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 normal for the new generation, and that's that's a sign of hope we can achieve by con keep on working and uh, giving the internet and our community our communities the Gregorian chant. Yes, and at the same time, I think, which is also interesting, it also connects the generations. So it's not only a way to to distinguish our generation from the older generation, but it's interesting to see that even though uh, certain teachings of the church might not have been very popular with the older generation, they've always had, they've always kept the sensibility of the Gregorian chant. So I, I remember once I was in a monastery in, in the Netherlands, lots of old uh, old sisters there, and I was chanting some of the some of the Christmas uh, chants there. And, and these sisters, they knew them by heart and they said, what, said to me, well, actually, we don't sing them anymore, but we would love to sing them again. So there's something of this quality of Gregorian chant, which, which transcends the generations um, and also connects them to each other. And that's beautiful. I, and, and are you, I, in your experience, uh, are you seeing more local parishes adopting this and trying to learn it because it can be intimidating when you first hear it it sounds so glorious and majestic that you think gosh it's it wouldn't be possible to get a few people together to learn this but that's not necessarily true so you know maybe tell us a little bit about that the encouraging signs that you're seeing of it being brought back into the liturgy and um your experience of perhaps teaching this to people and, and how they find it as they're learning to sing it Actually, as uh, as Brother Stefan said, we we see uh, at least in Switzerland because that's what I know, uh, and in Switzerland and also a bit in, in France, you've got l l little small choirs of uh, Gregorian chant, uh, which are flourishing uh, here and there because of uh, because of individual initiatives from from uh, from uh, young people in general. But then in the choir, you find uh, all the generation, uh, all the gener generations uh, which are coming together to, to sing again uh, Gregorian chant. And these kinds of uh, scola or choirs are, are flourishing again. But we, we had to wait uh, like 50 years to see uh, this this uh, revival we can say I, I have a question why is it do you think that we abandoned gregorian chant if this is so beautiful so majestic so uplifting to the soul which it undoubtedly is what happened that it felt like almost universally we ditched it um and in its place brought in these 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 songs, you know, let us build the city of God. Oh, Lord. Uh, how, did, how did this happen? I think it, 
first of all, it has to do with the fact that after the Second Vatican Council, um, we allowed the mass to be said in the vernacular, uh, in, in in the the language of, of in the other languages, so not just in Latin. Um, and then we thought, well, we will compose new music, and um, but not everyone. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. But another aspect of it, which is also very important, I think, is that it's not easy. It's not easy to uh, to sing it actually. So it should be part of a certain formation of priests, of religious. And if it's not part of the formation, it's very difficult to have this group of people chanting a Gorian chant together. Because, of course, we can read the text and we can try to sing it, but there's really also a certain spirit of Gregorian chant which you have to which you have to learn. And the only way to, to learn that is by doing it. So I think after the Second Vatican Council, there was this general movement um, to get a little bit rid of the Latin, which was never, of course, uh, of course part of the documents, because in Sacro Sanctum Concilium, we read that uh, Gregorian chants should have pride of place in the liturgy. But, um, well, not everyone took that very seriously. Um, but I think I think it has to do with that. So we said we will we will uh, celebrate in the vernacular, and then we will compose new music in the vernacular, which is not a bad thing. Huh? I'm not against that at all. Um, but I'm just saying that I think it's that has really contributed to the fact that we have left a little bit the, the path of Gregorian chant. And we said, well, if you cannot understand it, well, why why should we actually do it? But that's of course terrible to say because if we if we think about music as being a little bit more absolute than just subjective uh, feelings and everything, um, that you can be touched by music even without understanding it. Because I remember when I was a child, uh, we had this Latin mass every week. I was completely impressed by it. I almost, I think I found my vocation partly in that liturgy. Um, and it's terrible then to say, well, because you don't understand, you cannot be uh, touched by it. I think we really uh, underestimate um, the beauty and the tradition and the, the, the power of that tradition, which can help us to to enter into the mystery of our liturgy. Yeah, I um, yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of almost ashamed to say that I used to, uh, you know, we had a little band, you know, and we would we even played a Metallica song in one holy mass. Would you believe that, brothers? <laughs> please which, don't which, please don't hang one, up on me. Um, which one was it? <laughs> um, it and was uh, Mama said from Load. So at least it wasn't a heavy metal ballad. I think once we played Nothing Else Matters instrumentally, and you know, I, p part of me feels Im I am embarrassed to say that, but honestly, I was never taught that that music ought to be good and beautiful. Right? We were just told do whatever you want. People wanted to get the young people involved in Holy Mass, and so that's what we did. Um, it's it's kind of sad that we, we did that. Here's a question for you. Um, someone might be watching right now and they think, golly, I go to a church and the music, you know, you've got some guy on the guitar and the djembe and these uh, instruments are fine in and of themselves, but we would like to raise the level of the sort of sacredness of the liturgy. What do they do? That's a very good question. Um, that depends, of course, on, on the parish, um, because it, we also you also need the capacity to do it. So you need people which, which have a little bit of a background in music, because it's it's very important to have this natural understanding also of what music is and how to how to breath uh, breathe, for example, how to use your body in the music. All of this is very important for Gregorian chant. Also, we could also use the the Dominican philosophy of uh, well. Um, Grace elevating nature. So you, you should first <laughs> be very, of course, be very careful to to know the the natural understanding of what what music is and how to sing before you can elevate it by grace and, and by this beautiful tradition of our revelation of our church. Um, then also there's a beautiful website which I use a lot. It's an American website actually. It's called uh, CC Watershed, ccwatershed.org, and there you have beautiful um, introduction for Gregorian chant. You have all, all the ways of reading Gregorian chant. Um, and there are so many resources on the internet. And CC Watershed gives you all these databases of Gregorian chant and also all the ways to sing it and the technique. But um, you should have some people which, which have a general background already in music, I think. That, that really helps to, to then also get, get used to uh, Gregorian chant. And also, uh, uh, Gregor Gregorian chant uh, during, during uh, centuries and centuries of... Uh, religious life or monastic life 
uh, they they had no uh, no scores. Only mm. the cantor uh, had the score. So Gregorian chant more than I think more than any kind of chant or uh, music is uh, is a, a great way to enter in music and in sacred music because you can you can just imitate it. It's uh, you, you can. That's exactly what we do. We we put we put videos online on YouTube, but uh, that's for people to to imitate it, to to sing along with us, and to learn by imitating and by repeating and repeating. It's uh, it's really a, a normal uh, tradition. It's um, it should not be at least at first intellectual so mm. it, just go to if you want to if you want to begin uh, gregorian chant and to to sing it in, in your parish ask your priest before and then go to <laughs> your to your library uh, christian library and you you just buy the graduale romanum the the books from the the, the church of rome and uh, you you buy some you made uh, photocopies for for your uh, your fellow uh, singers and you just go on with youtube and you find uh, watershed or musica sacra and and just go imitate it and and don't be afraid uh, of the the um, the latin text and the the apparent complexity of the of the, the notes and just go for it and if also gregorian chant is made for uh, for churches with nice acoustics and uh, if your church is is, uh, is flattering with uh, the acoustics it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's, a, it's a one more reason to to go with the gregorian chant it's like singing in the shower everybody thinks they sound better in there than they they may actually do <laughs> Um, and in the end, yeah. it's for the Lord. So just go with it. it, it also, will, one it little advice. You. One little advice would also be to to start with the the things that don't change in the liturgy. So the parts of the liturgy which stay the same. So we have to we have the ordinary of the liturgy, which is uh, Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, all the parts that don't change. Pater Noster, the Our Father. We say in all the liturgies um, and then you have the proper parts and that will be the next step so the first step will be to to understand how do i sing a simple kyrie lord have mercy in english i believe um, <laughs> and glory be to god the glory be to the so that we will be the gloria yeah I, I i would like you to email me some links that i can share with our with our viewers i'll put them in the description once you send them to me after this interview but i know you have your own channel could you talk a little bit about that how people can find it and why they should check you all out i let stefan do that <laughs> thank you so much i'm flattered <laughs> yes no problem uh, so we started uh, one year ago a little bit more than a year ago um during the season of Advent. Um, and we started this channel because we had uh, Gregorian chant lessons every two months. Um, and we were singing, of course, Dominican Gregorian chant. That means the chant that is really part of our own Dominican order, which is different than the Roman chant. But the problem was there was no, um, there was no way to actually uh, repeat this online because there were no examples on the internet. There was nothing. Um, well, of course, there are the famous Salva, there's the famous Salva Regina from the Dominicans, the Old Lumen from the Dominicans, and some other uh, things. But not there was not a systematic database, a library of all our Gregorian chants. Um, so then we decided to do this ourselves. So uh, we started with um, the Te Deum, actually, which is one of the, the chants which we sing in our Office of Readings. The Office of Matins, which we uh, traditionally sing, uh, sang always very early in the morning. Um, and we recorded that in Chalet. So Chalet is a beautiful place in France. It's very close to the uh, Carthusian Monastery uh, of uh, La Grande Chartreuse. And there we started our channel. And then we were completely uh, overwhelmed by the response because 
there were lots of people um, who were actually watching the channel. And we thought, oh, we, we are only going to do this to actually help people, uh, help the Dominicans to rediscover their uh, patrimony, their Gregorian chant. Uh, but actually, the, the, it was way bigger than that. So people from all over the world started sending us emails and, and responses and everything. And then there were some, some big uh, news websites who made articles about our project. And in that way, actually, we said, well, we really have to continue. We have to create a library of Dominican Gregorian chants. And since then, we have actually said, well, every week we will publish a piece of Gregorian chant, at least one, sometimes two, three or four. So it depends a little bit on the on our mood and if we have time, because we also need to preach and to study and to contemplate. So we cannot just sing all the time. <laughs> but it's very, so that's how it started. So it started as a way to teach Gregorian chant uh, for other Dominicans. And it's still used. I know, for example, uh, some brothers in Oxford are using it in London. Uh, so it's that's re that remains the primary goal of the project. But now it has become a project which is way bigger than that. It's also evangelizing the world. It's uh, we have so many people who are emailing us, uh, Catholics, but also Protestants, atheists, Jews, uh, uh, Muslims, uh, lots of people who are completely uh, overwhelmed by the by the beauty of this Gregorian chant. I think um, due to the abuses that have taken place after, not necessarily because of, but after the Second Vatican Council, Yes. And due to the frustration many people feel about this, this can lead some people to say things that aren't faithful to the church. They say things like the Novus Ordo is not a true mass. It's not valid. And, and it's, they, they go to the extreme and th they can fall into the temptation. And uh, none of us are immune to this. So I put myself in that category of looking down their noses at people who are not true, quote unquote, true Catholics. How can we guard against this mentality? Again, a very good question. <laughs> Maybe Alexander can respond, can respond to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll try my best, but perhaps one, one thing is to, to remind people that actually the, musically speaking, the Gregorian chant, Latin chant, is the chant of the church is officially the chant of the church and all the other things that we did in uh, vernacular languages are uh, we can do it but it was as the the, the, the council said uh, wrote it was ad libitum it was a possibility it was not the the main things to do but uh, at least in europe i don't know in the united states of America, but in Europe, they they understood it uh, completely in reverse. It was okay. Now we are we are doing everything in vernacular languages, and we are uh, we are moving. Uh, we are letting down uh, Gregorian chant. But a, a way to to reconciliate uh, the two profiles you 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 mentioned, uh, the two profiles of uh, people you you mentioned, is perhaps to to re-implement uh, Gregorian chant in in normal parishes, to to show that to show traditionalists that uh, normal Catholics or uh, less true Catholics are are actually also singing singing the the official uh, chant of the church and uh, as the traditionalists. And so we are, we are uh, together in the end. And that's, that's, I think, the message we should bring out, at least as preacher. We, we cannot divide, that's not our aim. And chant, Gregorian chant and sacred music is also there to, to, to reunite us among Catholics. Yes, I, I completely agree. And um, I think also this has to do with the fact that um, the the Mass after Vet uh, the Second Vatican Council um, is sometimes not celebrated in the most dignified manner. Um, 
But if we actually take very serious the documents of the council, and if we have also, and I, I, I find this more and more important, if we have the inner disposition, if we have a, a living faith with Christ during the day, if we have a conversation with Christ during the day, if we, if we live in the presence of God every day of our lives, and especially as preachers and as priests, that will change the way we celebrate Mass. It, it doesn't, of course, it's the same text because in the, in our Roman liturgy, we very much emphasize the objective text of the church. So it doesn't really matter if, who is celebrating and because Jesus is the same in that sense. But it does help us if we have priests and religious people who are really trying to live out that, that relationship with our Lord in the most intimate manner, because that, that helps us also to, to celebrate that mass with an inner disposition. A disposition which should always be part of our of our uh, of our cult, so to say. So it means also when we, I speak from my own experience. When we when I go to the to the lords or to the vespers before that, I I make some silence in my in my heart, and I I'm doing this to 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 make sure that I have this 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 real relationship with our Lord, that I'm I'm conscious of the fact of what I'm doing. I'm not just uh, saying psalms. I'm we are trying to to enter into this relationship. And I think that's very important because, and that's all a danger for everything which we repeat. Also, uh, for example, the rosary or the mass, all these things. At a certain point, we can say, oh, we are, we're going to do it again. Same text, same Our Father, same. But we have to try to, to, to get into this very intimate relationship with our Lord. Um, and then it will change the way we, we say the texts and the, the way we pray. This, um, this I think that be... is... So, uh, Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I say this could be uh, analogized to my relationship with my wife. Uh, we go on another date. What do we do? We have dinner the same time. We come home. We, we're intimate. What do we, why, why do we do the same thing? Uh, what, what needs to change is not the date night, but my love. Yeah, exactly. We should, we should see our religion more as a friendship in the first place than, than only a theory. Of course, that's very important. And we want to know everything. Of, of our friends. So, of course, we study and we contemplate and we do all these things. But, yeah, it's also very important to have this relationship and this friendship. This is the first, the first thing, always. It, 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 seem, it seems to me that if the church does not pl create and offer a sacred space where we can, as it were, fall to our knees, kiss, kiss the earth, who will provide that space? And... Uh, as, as our states become increasingly secular, as our households become increasingly secular and divided, it seems to me that modern man wants desperately to find a place where he can know his place in the hierarchy of being, that he can kneel down, open up his mouth, receive our Lord, know his place as it were. And I, I do think that this is the hunger that many young people, I'm not that young, but young people have where they... They don't want to go to church where people shuffle about the place like it is a 7-Eleven or a Walmart. And we all kind of, it's a, we speak the same, we dress the same as everywhere else. We, we, we just want to go somewhere where our desire for the infinite and all good God is treated with respect and seriously. And if you give me uh, talking among other things and uh, bad music and sloppy liturgy, I feel offended because my love for Jesus Christ, my desire for him is not being treated seriously. I feel I am being patronized. And this is, nobody likes to feel that way. But that yeah, your, your message, Matt, is, is really wonderful. And that's, that's our responsibility as priests, as brothers, uh, to, to hear just what you just said, because when we are a boss of a parish, we, we need to listen to, 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 to the, the message that people sent us and to, to understand that you, the, the believers need a place which is intimate, which is respectful for God. And um, a lot of times... That's the responsibility of the priest, and he, he, he should he should take it. I hope a lot of priests and brothers are listening to us now. And 
have heard what you said. Okay, well, I'd like to take some questions soon from our live audience. Uh, we have almost 200 people who are watching right now, and it's lovely to have them all here. Um, we have lots of questions uh, from people coming in. So if you're watching in the live stream right now, please please feel free to, to, to send a question in. Um, maybe I'll begin with a question. Uh, if somebody has no experience of sacred chant, of singing it themselves, is there a particular song that you might suggest they learn to become more comfortable with singing in this sort of way that's not too intimidating? So uh, then I would say, oh, yeah. go on. Yeah, go on, go on. <laughs> Uh, then I would say um, parts of, of the mass which which don't don't change. Eh? So the ordinary part of the mass, for example, the if we talk about the Gorian chant, then um, something which comes up every every now and then, every mass, of course, every office also is uh, the Our Father. So the Pater Noster. Uh, that's that's not very difficult to learn actually. That might be a good way uh, way to start. Also to to learn the the acclamations. Um, so the, the way to respond to the priest. Uh, so when this priest sings, uh, Dominus vobis cum, uh, that you know that you have to, uh, to respond. Exactly. That's it. These kinds of things. I, um, so I love the Dominican Salve. It is the most beautiful song to Our Lady that I've ever heard. <laughs> it's very difficult. <laughs> Very difficult. <laughs> what is the more, tra I suppose, traditional or the, the more reg, the common, the more common salve? What is that referred to as? Salve Regina Mater. What's this called? It's the, it's the, the salve, the Roman salve Regina. And the, it's uh, actually, we say the tonus simplex, simple tone. The, would, the simple would you like, part. would you like to know? It's a good story. Would you like to know how I first learnt this? Yeah, I hope I hope you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting in a uh, CD. Do you say that word? Like a rundown pub in Michigan, with the founder of Ignatius Press, Father Joseph Fessio, ah, and yeah. we we were having a meeting there because it was by our hotel, and we had just finished a beer. And he says, well, why don't we finish with the salve? And I, I did not know this. And so we sat there around the sticky <laughs> bar table. Salve Regina. And it was the most beautiful thing. And so the next day on my plane flight home, I downloaded that and I just sang it again and again and again and again until I finally could sing it. And now it is my son Peter's favorite part of the rosary. He wants us to hurry up so we can sing the salve together. <laughs> Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> okay, so we have some questions, and so I'll throw them up on the screen here. And let's say I'll move them so we can uh, we can see you. Uh, this comes from Adam. He says, "Why did Latin become the traditional language in the church as opposed to Greek or Aramaic, for instance?" Want to take that, Alexander? <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm not sure I know the answer, but. Part of that answer is um, why Latin? Because um, since the church is in is in Rome, it means uh, since uh, Peter and Paul, uh, the um, the language wa was Latin for the theology also, and the Gregorian chant and Gregorian texts, and comes from the the translation of the Bible, the Vulgata for example, which is in Latin, and all the theology was also in Latin in the occidental uh, part of the, of the world. So very early on, you have um, Latin is really dominant in, in occidental uh, Europe, Western U Europe. And, but for example, um, yeah, that's, I think it's, it's a matter of uh, geography, because also, the the, um, the early councils, the the grace, the first councils of the Christian era, um, they were uh, translated in in Latin. The Acts of the councils, mm -hmm. 
were translated in Latin for uh, for the the Western U European uh, theologians like uh, Saint Ambrosius or Saint Augustine. They they wrote in Latin. I yes, so it's proper to our Roman. Latin. It's proper to our Roman tradition, but that doesn't mean that uh, that you cannot celebrate in other languages. Also, of course. Because the the Orthodox Church, for example, they they have that liturgy in Greek, or, and we also have uh, some in the Middle East. We have some churches which are, which are connected to the Catholic Church. I don't know the specifics of that, but they celebrate also in Aramaic, for example. So it's not it's not it's because the Roman liturgy. It's proper to the Roman liturgy, and the Roman liturgy is what we celebrate mm -hmm. in most uh, Western countries in Europe. So and that's, also, that's the it's like uh, sorry. It's it's like Latin back then uh, is like uh, English today. Uh, it's it's really a universal uh, among all the dialects in Europe. Latin was uh, mastered by everyone, at least the clerks. So yeah. it was easier to communicate. Okay, another question from Chad Meyer who says, how can we as the laity develop a more robust liturgical piety? Oh, I like that question. Um, that's a very good question because I think it helps a lot when we, for example, before mass, when we read some of the readings for the mass, that helps us to already enter into, well, what, what is Christ going to say to us in this uh, particular mass on Sundays? Um, silence is very important. So before mass that we, we have this disposition of, of silence before we enter, huh? before we enter our church. Um, well, what can we see? Uh, um, yeah, go on, Alexander. The, a great way, liturgically speaking, a great way to, to become more robust is to introduce your, yourself or your, uh, your, your parish uh, to the liturgy of the hours, to pray uh, yeah. sometimes the uh, Vespers, for the, the Sundays or uh, or loads in the morning or uh, uh, a shorter version of loads or uh, of Vespers, but it's it's uh, it's really it's liturgical and it's the prayer of the church. Okay, we we have a question from a, a Muslim friend who is here, and it's an honor to have you, Harris. Thank you for your open mindedness and being here. He says, how do you feel about being called the brothers of the Christ? So again, this is coming from a Muslim question, a questioner. Perhaps he, perhaps, yeah, so perhaps he means, I mean, he's coming from uh, Islam, where God is viewed differently. And he is just asking two brothers, religious brothers. So he may, I'm not sure his familiarity with Christians, how often he interacts with them. But he says, how do you feel about being called the brothers of the Christ? I'm not sure what this means. And I apologize, I can't interpret it correctly, or may, may, I may not. But perhaps he means, if Christ is God, uh, how do you have this familial relationship with him? That's how I, I interpreted it. I think I would completely agree. Eh? One of the great um, um, things that Tom Aquinas taught us is that the human nature, well, actually also the church fathers, but... Uh, Thomas Aquinas makes a thin synthesis, of course, of all the church fathers. Um, but um, that the human nature of Christ is the way to enter into the div divinity, uh, to, to enter into the divine, so in God the Father himself. So it's this participation in the divine life of Christ, which is made possible by the humanity of Christ himself. Um, so in that way, I, I completely agree with what, what is stated here. Christ in his divine nature and his human nature, which is unified in one person. And uh, because we are ourselves humans, we have this possibility to to elevate our souls through the um, human nature of Christ himself towards the divine. Uh, oh, okay, uh, this question here. Thank you, Father, uh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so you look like a priest. That'll... Okay. Um, this Message, person says, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> the, sac the sacred council asks for the liturgy of the hours to be the public prayer of the universal church. Also for priests to do so I, in the parishes, at least lords and vespers. How to promote that? Perhaps you should try to convince your priest that 
if you take on that uh, engagement to 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 do loads and to promote load and vespers in your parish it, it would it would have more time for other things to organize other things so it would let you do it and you you could promote little dirty hours as as the the church wants it exactly and that can start very very um you can start very easily with just saying it, for example, and then you add certain parts of it. You sing, for example, the Pater Noster, which, what we said in, in Latin, for example. Then you can actually add psalm tones to it. So you can say, we start in English, for example, with Gregorian psalm tones. And in that way, you introduce every, every time you introduce something new. And in the end, you have uh, solemn Gregorian Vespers after a few years with incense and, uh, and everything. <laughs> um. That's good. Here's a question that I have. Um, I think more and more people having become um, disillusioned by the lack of the sacred in their parishes are turning to Eastern Catholic churches um, because there they celebrate the divine liturgy and there's a sense of reverence there. What is your opinion on this? Um, is this something that we should perhaps look down upon and say, listen, stay within your tradition and elevate it? Or do you think this is a fine thing for people to do? Um, I think that um, certainly they are, to use the expression which uh, was just uh, mentioned, um, they are brothers in Christ. So certainly they have a, have a beautiful liturgy and they can they can help us to understand some aspects of our liturgy which we have for which we have forgotten, for example. But at the same time, if we are Roman Catholics, of course we the normal way to celebrate would be in the Roman liturgy. But um, I know, for example, some brothers who actually uh, every now and then visit an Eastern uh, Orthodox uh, liturgy. I do that myself sometimes, but it's not to replace uh, the the Sunday liturgy which we have here or the conventual liturgy. May I clarify? I, I do not. I do not mean at Catholics attend Orthodox churches who are in schism. I mean Catholics ah, okay. attend Eastern Catholic churches, ah, Eastern which Catholic. would fulfill their Sunday obligation. So mm. there is nothing prohibiting them from doing this. I wouldn't make that statement. But I wonder oh, what course, you yeah. think about this. Kind of almost like, well, I haven't been given a tradition, and I'm in a part of the world or where I'm not. It's, there's, there's a lack of reverence, and I see people, myself included at one point, turning to the East. Um, I just wanted to see if you had an opinion on that. It, perhaps it, it really depends, but uh, it, it can be that it, during a, a period of your, your life, you, you, you need to be, to be nourished, and so just, just go there and take your... Uh, if I can say so, take your uh, your weapons, but come back where where you belong to bring what you what you you learned there, in in terms of uh, sacred liturgy and the beauty of celebration and yeah, taking the time the the time and the respect for the the sacred, and I think it's like I don't know how we. How is it called in the gospel in English? But the, the, le, Stéphane, you could help me for, uh, for that. It's like le levain dans la pâte in French. Ah, uh, yeah, no, I don't know that. Le levain dans la pâte. <laughs> yeah, I understand what you mean, but yeah. To, to stay where you belong and to, to grow from. B bloom where you're planted? In it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Harry uh, Waddington says, how might one best learn how to conduct Gregorian chant? And then there's a word that I do not know, chironomy. Is that how you say that? I've never heard of the term <laughs> chironomy. Okay. Well, how about just the, first, uh, just the first question? How might one best learn how to conduct Gregorian chant? To, well, to by, as, yeah, go on. Okay, uh, to conduct a Gregorian chant, you you don't have uh, any uh, rhythm, any uh, 
any um, indications of rhythm. So to conduct Gregorian chant, you need uh, your uh, singers to look at you all the time during the chant. And it's a matter, it's a really a matter of breathing. Of exactly. Breath. That's so very important, the breathing. You, 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 in Gregorian chant, you direct, you conduct less, less with your uh, hands than with your uh, breathing expressions. And that's... That's also why in most scholars, in most scholars, you don't really see someone in front of the choir. Most of uh, most of the time, the conductor is himself in the choir, integrated in the choir himself. So in the circle, so to say. Um, and this is one very important aspect, actually, that the ideal situation in Gregorian chant is to sing with one voice. So to really listen to each other and to, to have this unifying aspect um, to sing together. And that's very important. That's very difficult um, to sing exactly in the same manner and to, to sing like one voice. But when you have this blending of voices, um, that's quite magical, I have to say. We have experienced and it a lot in... Uh, if you if you die if you want to conduct we go and chant with hands because that's almost a so chironomy that's almost a reflex it it, it should not show the um, the the tempo like ta 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 but <laughs> more the um, the in french what we call the num the yeah. um, the direction of the breathing so it it needs to be really smooth and it's not uh, the cl your classical uh, mu classical music director. It's it's uh, yeah breathing in and out. It's more uh, big gestures like slow. <laughs> yeah, because the square notes are quite a recent development. Because in the beginning we only had these nums, these waves, so to say, um, which we would follow, and that we still do, as as Alexander said. Uh, in the graduale triplex, for example, you have you still have the no the the nooms which are shown in, in the in the book itself. Yeah. Uh, thank you. This question comes from Bo Beckwith. He says, "I am a trained vocalist and convert from Protestantism, and recently started cantering. How can I, and is it proper for me, to influence the music style practice at my parish?" We have addressed this, but maybe you'd like to say something else. Well, I think one important aspect is that we, um, as as promoters of Gregorian chant, we don't sing in the liturgy, but we sing the liturgy itself. So what is very important is that as a musician, you have a knowledge of how the liturgy works. There are lots of musicians who don't, who don't have this knowledge, only have a professional knowledge of secular music. But there's really a structure in the mass uh, with an introit, for example, an offertorium, uh, uh, communio. So all these texts have been given by the church and it's our task as musicians to be at the service of this liturgy, not to distract the people, but to have to have them to have them to lift up their souls towards Christ. So that means we have to respect the, the liturgical texts which are in the books. Um, and if we cannot, we search for something which is very close to the, the liturgical text, of course. But the ideal is that we sing the text itself, uh, which have been given to us uh, through the perennial tradition of the church. And often they are, of course, uh, texts from the Bible itself, eh? from the from the Psalms and from the... Yeah. We are singing scripture, Holy Scripture. Yes. Okay, uh, a question here. Uh, can you speak a bit about mixed scholars, men and women? Should scholars usually consist of only men or only women, with exceptions here and there, for mixed voices? It depends really of the um, of the of why you are singing together. For example, in a, in a priory, in a brothers' priory, it's it's not uh, imaginable that we are uh, we we sing Gregorian chant with a, a mixed uh, scholar because it, it it doesn't it doesn't go well. But uh, if you are um, I know a lot of choirs in Switzerland who are uh, mixed choirs and they, they sing some Gregorian chant but outside of liturgy for concerts and and it works very well. But it really depends 
for me there's there's no the only rule here to apply is the where and why is the choir constituted yes i find it quite beautiful for example to have a um, some part of the mass which you which you alternate between man voice and, and woman voices for example the alleluia you could say the woman do that um, or you say the for the introit that the men start with the with with the introit and then the verse the psalm verse that the woman take that aspect of of the of the introit and also of course um the sacrosanctum concilium doesn't only talk about um gregorian chant but also about polyphony and for that you certainly uh, need uh woman voices so it if you have woman voices it also helps to to have this rich uh, tradition of polyphony which you can also integrate uh, in the liturgy Thank you. Uh, Joey, thank you for your super chat, Joey. Appreciate it. He says, what period of the liturgical year contains your favorite sacred chant and why? Go on, Alexandra. I think we agree, well, actually. Yeah, I think that's the same for you. <laughs> uh, Tell me. <laughs> for, for me, the, the, the period of the liturgical year is... Um, most favorite is the 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 three doom the three holy days before uh, easter next because week you, next week you, you have magnificent uh, gregorian chant which are deep which are telling us about the the really the center of the christian life of the mystery of christ and of why i gave my life for passion of Christ and the resurrection, so and we are singing that the lament lamentation of uh, Jeremiah the prophet, yeah. the, the the exultet, which is the the preconium pascal, the, the most wonderful piece for me. The exultet for me is the yeah you announce the resurrection. I have nothing to add to that question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> response. I, we may have already touched upon this, but maybe just answer this uh, uh, just quickly. Maybe what are your brother's favorite chants? Well, because we are still in the season of Lent, um, one chant which I love a lot is Media Vita. Um, it's a chant which speaks about um, in the midst of life, we are in death. Um, so really about the uh, the fact that we are all mortal beings and that uh, we always should have this this resurrection in front of our eyes because that's where we are going. We are going to die at a certain point in our lives. And that's uh, one of the chants which also moved Thomas Aquinas a lot. Eh? He was in tears. That was uh, one of the favorite chants of Thomas Aquinas. Media vita in mortis sumus. That's a beautiful chant. Maybe Alexander has some others. Well, there are so many, but... Uh, I don't know. I agree. <laughs> for example, another one is Vexilla Regis, which we uh, sing in this week. That's the hymn for the Vespers in the in the Passion Week, so the week before the Holy Week. Um, it speaks about about the cross. It's really a um, a hymn towards the cross, so to say. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this one is a proper uh, from our, our Dominican tradition, but still, it's a very nice chant. Yeah, that's true. It's not proper. That's really yeah. Okay, um, <laughs> I just forgot what I was going to ask. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, here's a question. Um, I, I presume you have some familiarity either with you know, buying or listening to music online, yes? Sorry, I didn't. Understand. Do you use like Spotify, iTunes? You listen, like, I don't know what it's like over there, and you guys are. Uh, brothers, so I'm not sure, but you listen to Gregorian chant online, I presume? And if so, what is the best album we can all go and listen to right now? <laughs> oh. Of Gregorian I, chant. I, 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 sent you the, I sent you the link um, for the description, but uh, for me, the, the best uh, Gregorian chant album uh, for me is, uh, is the one from the the book of Job, so yes. it's a Cistercian Cistercian uh, mm -hmm. Gregorian chant, uh, sing, sung by the the Gregorian chant choir of Paris, and that's mm -hmm. 
you 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 cry instantly. <laughs> That's. <laughs> Th thank you. I will be sure to put these in the description to all of your watching, so you can find it for yourself. Yeah, you can find it uh, find it on YouTube, but I'll, uh, I'll pass you the link. Thank you, brother Stefan. Any uh, anything to <laughs> yes. add? Yes. Well, it depends a little bit on your school and on your mood, because sometimes you are in. Well, yeah. So, um, for example, I I love a lot. Also, it's it's a complete other interpretation of Gregorian chant. It's very what we say in English, I think, virile. Um, so it's the, the the style of Marcel Perez from the Ensemble Organum. Um, it's it's a very archaeological approach to Gregorian chant. But of course, we don't know exactly how it sounded in the in the in the first centuries and everything of the, of the church. But this is a very interesting way with, with also some um, um, Byzantine uh, Byzantine influences. So it, it is a very strong way of singing Gregorian chant. Sometimes you need that. So that's another school. So because there are so many schools in, in Gregorian chant, um, so it's very difficult to pick one one album because every album has their own uh, well, their own way of of, of yes. interpreting the Gregorian chant. Also, the Dominican yeah. Gregorian chant is also different than the Benedictines, for example, or yes. the Cistercians. Or the, uh, strong, uh, strong Gregorian chant may be a necessary initial. Uh, what do you say? Remedy to the effeminate and uh, <laughs> awful music we've been subjected to these last few decades. Uh, okay, uh, I, I got to ask this question uh, because it's. I think it's a great one. And uh, let's see here. It comes from Daniel. Is it possible to pray the Holy Rosary in Gregorian chant form? I would like to learn how to if it is prayed in this way. And are there some resources to learn from? I think it's not proper to the tradition of the rosary to sing it that way. It is possible, of course, to artificially do that uh, with uh, with Hail Marys. For example, you sing an Ave Maria every time, a Pater Nost and everything. But I'm more of a someone of, of the school that prays the rosary every day um, during my work also. And during It's a very practical prayer. It's not a prayer yes, which I... That's supposed <laughs> to go for two hours. Yeah, exactly. It's not... It's not supposed to be there to to continue and continue and continue. So I'm, you can you can chant it, of course, and feel free to do it. But it's not my personal uh, 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 preference, so to say, um, because it, it takes very long. Then you are it mm. takes like an hour. You can do that, for example, in a church. That's beautiful to do it for for a Sunday liturgy or something like that. Uh, to do something uh, for the Sunday um, with a group of uh, people in the parish. That's beautiful. But to have every day. To sing every day the, the rosary would be a little bit too much, I think, for me, personally. And if you if you really want to to do it that way, you can just go uh, on the website gregobase gregobase.com, and you find yeah. Pater Noster, the the Roman one, Vatican. Exactly. You you learn it, and Ave Maria, also the simplest one. And you you learn it, and then you you can solemnize it uh, in your in your church or in your parish if you if you want. Okay, well, hey, this has been really uh, enlightening and a fantastic chat. I appreciate you guys taking the time. As we wrap up, would you tell our viewers how they can learn more about you and uh, and yeah, well, that's it. How to learn more about you and the work you're doing? Of course. So we started the channel OP Chant which is uh, short for uh, Ordo Predicatorum, Order of Preachers and Chant. And we publish every week on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash opchant. We publish a video of Gregorian chant. Um, you can also find us on Facebook uh, via the same uh, name, so opchant also. And we started also... Uh, with, uh, so you can also help us out financially because the cameras and the traveling and... Uh, all and it helps us to improve the project even more. Um, so it's it's a weekly uh, a weekly uh, thing. Every week we publish new videos. Excellent. Yes. I'm, today's as today's you... today's orate, as you can see, because uh, today we celebrate the Annunciation. Um, yes. It's the solemnity of the Annunciation. So the Arorat is the video which we have published out. Uh, for yes. Today. Lovely. Yes. Everyone, as you can see here, we're, we're we're looking at the website right now, so people could come here to OP for order of preachers chant.com 
And look at this down here. Watch all of our videos. Click, what does this say? By clicking our logo below, you have access to all of our videos. Boom. And then you have all the videos on YouTube. Beautiful. Oh, man, this is so lovely. So, yeah. yeah <laughs> you, you, for, for the, we are preparing for the early week. Next week, we have uh, at least, uh, I think, 10 videos coming out. 10 new, exactly. uh, new chants. And then every week, at least one. We, we we try we we follow the liturgical calendar so we are not uh, giving a lent chant during advent we are really uh, following the liturgical calendar because it's also uh, pedagogical for people to learn about uh, the tones and uh, the atmosphere of each liturgical season and also, we are on Facebook. We have a little Facebook page, which is also called the uh, OP Chant, where we we post uh, our videos from YouTube, but uh, the day of the the feast. Exactly. The, the chant we, of the day. We also put out commentaries there because, of course, these are, uh, as I said, these are um, uh, parts of the scripture of the Holy Scripture. So we try to interpret the Gorgorian chant also and to actualize it uh, in the liturgy of the, of the day, um, which helps people to understand actually uh, what we are singing that day. I want to um, just maybe conclude by sharing Sierra Dante's uh, comment here, because I, I think a lot of people feel this way. Uh, she says, how do we get our bishops <laughs> to allow this beautiful tradition to be incorporated into the mass? Many parishes resist change, even though this was the tradition so frustrating. Now, I, let me say something. Yours will be more helpful than my advice, um, but I'll say something in general. I think that when you sense that somebody is like fr frustrated and maybe you're just using this, you know, you're not actually frustrated yourself, but I can imagine people being like angry and frustrated. And this doesn't inspire and it doesn't sort of um, it, it doesn't sort of spread like enthusiasm and love does. So I think that those of us who would like to see sacred chant reintroduced into Holy Mass, uh, we should be r just sharing what we love with people. This is a uh, uh, and I think that kind of enthusiasm where we're not talking all the t time about what we don't like. We're sharing the beauty that's always been there in the tradition that we do love. And I think often that this is a more effective way of commu communicating this. But but what would you all say? Yeah, so I would say that it's a local thing. Huh? It, at first, it, it's a local thing. So it has to start in the parish itself. So the bishop in that sense doesn't have lots of things to do with that because it's the local parish uh, council and the, the pastor in the parish who can help you to to introduce this to your parish and as matt says if you show a lot of a passion for this kikorin chant i'm sure that that he will uh, he will be in favor of of integrating it um uh, but you need a group of people, and eh? so not on your own. You need to do it with other people who and are also it's passionate also, about this. It's also one thing to go to your priest or bishop and say, make this happen uh, to, to prelates who yeah. are presumably already very busy. It is another thing to say, we have this choir, and we are really, really good, and we would like to offer this. Um, I think many priests would be like, oh, thank God, I don't have to take on something else. This is something you can take on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so well, it has to really has to, sorry. No, please. <laughs> no, no, I, I only wanted to say that I think it also helps to, to organize some, for example, some extra liturgical services in the parish. For example, a rosary vigil. And if you do that and you show that you actually sing Gregorian chant in that vigil, then you can actually show the parish priest or other people around, well, I'm serious about this and I'm passionate about this and look what I can do. And then you can help um, introduce this aspect of the liturgy in the liturgy itself during Sunday Mass at a certain point. But you have to show that it's possible, of course. Uh, yeah. That's what we did, actually. We showed that it's yeah. possible to sing Gregorian chant and we are singing more and more Gregorian chant in our own respective communities. So it's really by doing it that... Uh, that you can change something. 
Okay, well, hey, thank you so kindly for your time. Big thanks to everybody watching. I'll be sure to put links to OP Chant and these other things that I should have put but forgot to as soon as, <laughs> as, soon as this live stream is over. Uh, brothers, may our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and bless your efforts. And thank you so much from the bottom of my heart uh, and those who are watching for your good work. This is very important stuff. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for the interview. We'll pray for you.